Welcome. Wherever you are, we welcome you to the second week of UCLA Arts 10 Questions Reckoning 2020. We are here in this moment on this day, which quite appropriately happens to be Indigenous Peoples Day, still known by some as Columbus Day, to contemplate the question, what is justice? As I continues against civilians, as private prisons disproportionately incarcerate black people, indigenous people, and people of color, as the pandemic most mercilessly impacts communities of color, as fires continue to devastate parts of the West and storms deluge the Gulf Coast, this is no ordinary time. Yet, this time sits along the continuum of a larger narrative of our histories together. While we can probably never fully respond to the question, what is justice? Perhaps tonight, we can begin to consider it from a variety of perspectives by laying out some of the ways in which members of our community consider justice at the heart of their work be it activism on behalf of racial, economic, and social equity, shifting perceptions about climate change, sustainability, and human and non-human relations, or the role and responsibility that artists and cultural institutions have to tell the stories that must be told in order to more fully weave the fabric of our humanity together. Though we are far apart in joining together from our homes, workspaces, and the other places in which we shelter, and we come together as beloved community to expand our perspective and to seek threads of connection. Our work tonight is not to find an answer, but perhaps what we can do in asking the question, what is justice? is offer a portal through which to expand and also ground our thought. For example, a thought. The world is wholly unjust. However, recognizing and thinking critically about the way injustice has been naturalized, made invisible to some while painfully visible to others, can become healing for individual and communal engagement. As we heard from Dr. Brannon last week, while it is sometimes easier to practice detachment, it is a step away from being fully present. And as Desmond Tutu said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. As we move through this evening, consider that this moment rests on the values and beliefs that have shaped opportunity or lack of opportunity, perspectives, and thus actions. Though each generation is different, where we are today is built on the intertwined histories of our parents and their parents before them. We might think of our institutions not only as mission-driven organizations, but as choreographies of values and beliefs that have been built from the materials of historic injustice, as well as from the aspiration for something better. Speaking about justice in UCLA, while there are plenty of reasons to critique the way the university, university tacitly confers more opportunity on some than others and affirms the experiences of some more than others, holds the resources to reach for a more just world. So how to grow towards justice, how to repair the violence of personal interpersonal, interspecies, and even planetary impacts. 
Cornell West said, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. For those of you who are joining for the first time, 10 Questions is an academic course offered by UCLA's School of the Arts and Architecture and simultaneously a public platform for thoughtful engagement with our extended community. While COVID-19 has prevented us from meeting together in the same room, it is a university without walls, a place to convene without having to traverse a gridlock city during rush hour, and for many of without even having to be in Los Angeles. It is here with you that we are bringing together the treasured resources of the university to build capacity in this time of urgent need and great precarity. Each week, we do not ask questions because we intend to find a singular coherent answer as much as we ask questions to discover more about the question and inquire more deeply into our lives. The format for this evening will include a 10 minute presentation from each of our panelists, followed by a brief conversation amongst them, shift to engagement amongst you and with you. You, students, and members of our extended community will have the opportunity to engage in small group discussions in Zoom breaks. The objective of these small group discussions is to converse amongst yourselves about what you've heard and perhaps come up with a question for consideration by our panelists. After the breakout sessions, we will reconvene in the webinar for a discussion with our esteemed guests. So let's begin. Our first panelist tonight is Isaac Bryan. Isaac is a director of public policy at the UCLL, UCLA Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies and the founding executive director of the center's Black Policy Project. Isaac's work focuses on helping to advance activist-led movements and policy change around issues of racial, economic, and social justice. Welcome, Isaac. Thank you for having me. And thank you for doing this incredible, incredible series. These, these are the conversations that we all need to be having as frequently as possible, and especially uh, in times like these. Uh, this week's conversation, or tonight's conversation, uh, deeply personal for me. And the question, what is justice, uh, resonates very deep, deeply uh, questions I grapple with daily. I'll have to admit, though, when I first heard the theme of tonight's conversation, I felt a little bit like James Baldwin, if that's not too bold to say, in that he once questioned you are asking me to speak on something for I've never seen, right? Which for black folks in this country, what is justice is a complicated question. So I'm preparing my thoughts for tonight and reflecting on that question. What hit me first and foremost, Rayshard Brooks, Laquan McDonald, Ahmed Arlan, Eric Gardner, Freddie Gray, Rakia Boyd, Waukesha Wilson, Dijon Kizzy, right here in Los Angeles, just a month ago, shot 16 times. Grishario Mack, John Horton, Michael Brown, Alton Sterling, Philando Castillo, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. When I think about what justice means, what is justice? I can't help but first grapple with what is injustice? Something I think we are all too familiar with and something that I think sets the framework or the foundation for how we define, articulate, and imagine what justice should look like. Black people in this country have been losing our lives violently at the hands of our criminal legal system and due to state sanctioned violence with impunity, without accountability, any civic redress of any kind for over 400 years. And so the events of this year, when I think about the things that took us out into the streets, the things that we marched for, 
right? The grand jury verdicts, the way that our systems have been designed to replicate themselves and exacerbate our social inequities, I know first and foremost, that is injustice. The fact that we have over 2 million people incarcerated here in the United States, which far and away exceeds any other industrialized nation on this world, that is an injustice. I know here in Los Angeles, we have a homeless crisis that exceeds that of any other jurisdiction. That homeless crisis, while black folks are only 8% of our city and our county population, there are over 40% of those living on our streets. That is injustice. I know that when it comes to policing poverty, arrests of unhoused people are one in five arrests made by the Los Angeles Police Department, despite the fact that 6,000 people in a city of 4 million, yet they are one in five arrests. And those arrests continue to go up every year, even as total arrests continue to go down. That's injustice. I know that 40% of the arrests by LAPD are those who are unemployed. That is injustice. I know that our children in our schools, particularly in LAUSD and schools all across, have police force presences, but don't have new textbooks. They have underpaid teachers. Uh, they have faulty equipment. They have overcrowded classrooms. They have lack of the infrastructure they need. And at the same time, have multi-million dollar investments in militarized police forces that criminalize them and stifle their ability to, to have a successful environment that builds opportunity. Instead, it starts the school to prison pipeline that leads to the other outcomes we just talked about. I know in LAUSD, one in four arrests by the school police are also a child in school or younger. And that the younger a child is, the more likely the child is to be black. That is injustice. I know that here in the state of California, we spend $13 billion on our carceral system every year, just at the state level, which far and away exceeds the money we spend on the University of California system of education. That is injustice. I know that people on parole are not allowed to vote, Prop 17. That is injustice. I know that if you are white with a criminal record, you are more likely to get a job than somebody who is black without. Same resume as injustice. I know that our county jail is the largest mental health provider here in Los Angeles, and it's the largest mental health provider in many jurisdictions. That's an injustice. Over 70% of the people incarcerated in LA County Jail suffer from either a mental or physical ailment. And instead of divesting from systems of harm and investing in systems of opportunity, we choose to continue to promote the injustice system. In fact, for people who suffer from co-occurring co disorders in LA County, a county of 10 million people, the County of Los Angeles only has 50 beds of support. Meanwhile, our county jail infrastructure supports a daily bed rate of 17,000 on any given night. That's an injustice. I know that over $3 billion every single year in the County of Los Angeles on our Sheriff's Department but only 200 million on alternatives to incarceration, communities, investments, youth development, and transitional housing. That is injustice. I know the city of Los Angeles spends $1.8 billion every single year on the LAPD. And at the same time, only spends 100 million a year to fight homelessness. That's an injustice. So when thinking about what is justice today, I first had to grapple with all of these things, right? The social determinants of health, the fact that folks are not allowed to live their full lives, the fact that $1 for a black family is for a white family, right? The fact that our economic, environmental, and social injustices coincide, overlapped, and intersect, and the criminal legal system sweeps up all of those failures. And after grappling with all of that, I got hit with a, a Toni Morrison quote. She said, we have to dream a little bit before we act. So even though I haven't seen justice truly is, especially as it pertains to our criminal legal system in this country, I do have the ability to dream. I also got hit with the idea that Martin had a dream and he lost his life for it. That is how, how desperate systems of harm are to keep the status quo, to maintain their lethal hold on our communities of color, our black, brown, our poor and indigenous communities. 
So even your dreams can be stuffed out and turned into nightmares, but we still have a responsibility to do that. And so coming here today, I didn't just want to depress everybody. I have some hope about what justice could look like. I have some dreams, some freedom dreams, as Robin Kelly might say. And I think a lot of you do too. More people marched after the murder of George Floyd than at any time in American history. This year, during a global pandemic, we cried out for accountability. We are crying out to redefine our systems of policing and our systems of accountability. So what justice looks like to me, justice looks like divesting from our, our systems of harm and investing in systems of care and opportunity, healing and growth. It means looking at the $1.8 billion that the city of Los Angeles spends on its police department and reimagining what those dollars reinvested in other institutions might do to promote public safety and well-being. It means not being afraid to challenge the fears we have of one another, the fears we have of ourselves, that choose to see the best in one another and invest in that. Invest as people in our interpersonal actions, but invest even more broadly as a society. That's the dream I have for justice. It's a dream black folks aren't overrepresented in our criminal legal system, or black folks aren't underrepresented in our systems of opportunity in our uh, systems of economic mobility. It's a system where our schools are properly funded because commercial tax rates haven't been stagnant since the 1970s. It's a dream where everyone's allowed to participate in our democracy, regardless of their entanglements with the criminal legal system that we know is racially biased and unjust. Justice to me means that young people can grow up with the expectation of living to their full life expectancy, no matter what zip code they are from or what color they are. Justice to me means that we all head towards the ideal and not just some at the expense of others. Justice to me is not an individual journey. It's a collective journey. It's a journey that we owe to ourselves. It's a journey we've marched for and it's a journey that so, so many have died for. And it's something that I hope we can take from the streets, halls of academia, into the systems and the institutions and the rooms of power and decision making, so that we can all be lockstep towards a future that we want. Conversely, there's a number of amazing scholars. I'm thinking of Kelly Lytle Hernandez and others who have been writing about justice and using the tools of research to illuminate injustice and develop interventions and policy solutions towards liberation. We need that. And it's a shame that our systems of higher learning are not invested in the same way that our jail infrastructure is. If we did that, we might have a broader imagination and we wouldn't have to dream so much because it would be coming reality. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful by all of you who are here today. I'm hopeful by all the movement that has happened. I'm hopeful that all of the lives that have been lost this year to the, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and at the hands of law enforcement agencies and at the hands of poverty in this country, I'm hopeful that all that pain, that suffering, that loss of life has inspired us that we haven't felt in a long time to do things differently, to head towards the ideal and to leave behind systems of harm that we have been comforted by, at least those of us who have, have had the privilege of not having any lethal interactions with them. But we have to move forward and we have to vote. This early in the election cycle, I can't help but say that we have to vote because a number of the injustices that were fresh on my mind and thinking about what justice is are on the ballot this year. The right to vote for those who, are, uh, who have served their time incarcerated and who are now under supervision is on the ballot this year. There is a ballot measure here in Los Angeles County that is called Measure J and it was named Measure for Justice, looking at the amount of money we're spending on our systems of harm and questioning that and calling for the county enemy in the world to invest at least 10% of its unrestricted revenues in systems of care and opportunity and not in systems of policing, confinement and harm. Justice is on the ballot. And this year we have to move. And so I'm so honored to be here with you.
to have this question, to grapple with what justice is. And I'm so grateful to hear from the other speakers tonight because we know that justice isn't just our criminal legal system. It intersects with all facets of our lives. And we have to be cognizant of the way that justice and injustice uh, can be manifested if we fight for it. So thank you. Thank you so much I, um, for both uh, giving us uh, the incentive to dream and also reminding us of the actions that we can take immediately, in fact. And um, I'm also struck by how much of our dreaming and our actions relate to where we put our money. And so I very much appreciate this. We'll have an opportunity to speak some more. Um, and now, I want to introduce our next guest. It's my great pleasure to introduce Aaron Cristoval, who is Associate Curator at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, Our Hammer. She is also co-founder with Amir George of the Experimental Black Radical Imagination. Her curatorial work focuses on experimental moving image and she has worked to raise the profiles of emerging LA artists of color. Welcome, Erin. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you all for having me here today to grapple with a massive question, what is justice? And I just wanted to thank Isaac for invoking Robin D.G. Kelly's Freedom Dreams, Black Radical Nation. That's definitely a Bible of mine as well, so I'm glad we're sharing space. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging that we are on Gabrielino Tongbin land in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day. And in terms of the question, what is justice? I'd also like to thank all of the staff and students who are actively fighting to divest from UCPD. Um, okay, so I will get started. Let's pull up the first slide. Okay, so I am an associate curator at the Hammer Museum down the street. If you guys haven't been, been up again, we're free. Um, and so as an institution, a contemporary museum, um, I think this question justice has been one that has been searing in my brain since the summer. Um, for all who are not aware, I think in this interesting way with the sort of, um, with the, you know, sort of the major presence of Black Lives Matter in response to the various murders and killings of Black folks by the police this summer, came um, also an outcry from museum workers and archers from all around the world. Um, there were open letters that were produced. There were social media campaigns that came to their websites that, that were made. And several things have sort of shaken out since then. So I want to, to use four words as sort of framing um, to help sort of understand how I think about justice in the art world and in the field of museums. Um, the first word is reimagining. Uh, the second word is repatriation. The third word is recentering. And the fourth word is restructuring. And with each word, I'll provide an example of something I witnessed or followed since the summer that has really pointed to this word as a potential and as a way to sort of rethink our museum and cultural spaces. So we'll go to the first slide. So this is a really incredible image of, as you can see here, Breonna Taylor being projected onto uh, the monument of Confederate General Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia. And this was done back in July. Um, so one of, I think, sort of the main points or the centerpieces of the art world is really thinking about public art and the history of monuments in this country. Um, I think there have been 
and some really interesting conversations and dialogue that have come up around monuments um, in the wake of several of you know these killings and just police violence in general. Um, and so this really struck me when I caught this image. Um, this is obviously in the midst of a protest in July in Virginia, which is one of the most sort of contested racially conflicting states, political states in this country that holds a deeply racial, racist and violent history. Um, and as you can see, the public has taken it upon themselves to re imagine this monument that is dedicated to a general um, who was racist, who was a white supremacist, and who upheld, um, you know, the, the patriarchy, the origin story of this country. Um, and so as you can see, the public has come together collectively um, to sort of reimagine this monument, has used this projection and projected her and BLM on top. And as you can see at the bottom, there's several sort of uh, graffiti um, uh, examples here. And I thought that this was really amazing because I think within this conversation around monuments, some people are arguing that they should be moved entirely from certain spaces. Some people are arguing that they, they should stay up as sort of a reminder, an important reminder of our historical past. Um, but I think this is sort of this perfect middle space of we can use them as blank, blank canvases and we can use them as spaces to reimagine um, a potential future for this country. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Repatriation. So we'll go to the next slide. So I wanna give you a little context here before I show you this video. So this is a video that was done um, also, I believe in July of this year. And the person that you see here, which you'll see a bit more clearly once the video starts is um, Congolese activist Mwazuli Diabanza. Um, he is part of a Pan-African group and what they do is they stage these actions across Europe where they go to encyclopedic European museums and they reclaim, in a sense, African cultural objects. Um, he's done similar actions in the Netherlands and south of France in the city of Marseille. Um, but here he is at the Musée de Croix Branly, uh, which is basically one of the main museums in France that holds the most African cultural objects. So uh, repatriation, for those who don't know, is a term in which, um, you know, I think a lot of encyclopedic museums are grappling with, right? Um, where they have held these cultural objects from various countries and continents all over the world, black and brown folks. And um, I think that this conversation around repatriation points to a very important point of the museum as a site, right? Which is museums in this moment, we need to address our histories. We need to understand where we come from. And in a larger sense, we need to understand the history of museums. So oftentimes um, museums historically have been sites to hold these objects, objects that were often looted or taken violently from people of color. And so I think it's important to align a colonial legacy with the history of museums in order for us to move forward thinking of these spaces. So um, we're gonna play the video now. This is him taking the object um, out of the space. And this is a 19th century world pole object. Um, and he says that the names at the entrance of this museum are the names of colonizers who pillaged the art that is now here. These items were pillaged between 80 and 1960 under colonialism. The act is a trigger for other powerful actions for the restitution of our stolen, looted, and plundered goods. We are risking a lot 
but what is this risk worth in the face of the corpses of women, children, young and old massacred before their deaths? So we'll play the video now. Richesse qui nous appartient et qui aujourd'hui mérite de retourner à la maison. Pendant que ces choses ont été pillées, colonisation et sous l'esclavage de 1880, justement en 1960, vous voyez tous les œuvres d'art venues du Cameroun, du Congo, du Sénégal, du Bénin, partout. Voici ces œuvres d'art qui ont été pillées et je suis venu récupérer ça. Au nom de l'unité, la dignité et le courage, ça rentre à la maison. On ne demande pas à un voleur la permission de prendre dans ce qui vous appartient. Ils ont pris ce qui ne leur appartient pas. Je suis venu prendre ça et je récupère ça. À tous les Africains d'humanité tout entière, vous qui avez contribué à voir l'Afrique piller, à voir. Um, so him and the group that you see with him were actually arrested after this action and they had a trial in September. Uh, the French state did not ask for prison time. They only demanded modest fines and there will be a final verdict for them scheduled on October 14th. Um, so we will go to the next slide. Recentering um, and we'll go to the next slide. So I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, this idea that, that as, as museum workers, um, our job is basically rooted in um, the caretaking of objects, right? Um, and I was really struck by a colleague of mine, Yasomi Omulu, who wrote this incredible um, 14 points on the limits of knowledge and care, um, again, in the wake of this summer, in the wake of the various police killings. And I thought that this was revelatory in that she truly outlined the history of museums and then sort of posed a larger question at the end. So I'll just quickly sort of read through these 14 points. So we'll go to the first slide here. Museums built on the ideological foundations of being repositories of knowledge and spaces of care and service of civic society in the Western world. The history of museums is tied to the colonial impulse to collect and amass objects and therefore cultural knowledge from the world over, charging specialist caretaker scientists with their interpretation. The conditions of collecting upon which museums were founded are inextricably linked to the colonial violence enacted onto the other non-Western bodies, spaces, and societies. Museums have its violence in their missions of knowledge formation and caring for objects. Care in museums Museums has been from a focus on safeguarding things and building Western art history in the century to the reification of public engagement in the 21st century. Next slide. Museums have always been exclusionary and for the privilege. They were built for the betterment of the Western subject and society at the expense of the other. This is further complicated by the fiction of emancipatory power of the cultural art object. Museums are deemed to be spaces of respite away from real politics and social injustices. By and presuming to be at the service of civic society on one hand, while setting themselves apart from it on the other hand. If museums can care for things, and the question that has been provoked in the midst of social upheavals and health pandemic of recent days, months, and years is for whom do they do this for? Next slide. The answer is obvious, obvious. The statements from museums in recent and coming days starkly reveal this. To acknowledge the limits of your knowing and caretaking is an important step, but to seek to make amends, repair, reconcile, and build future on broken foundations is difficult and potentially dangerous pass, path. The task of the moment is not to seek not, not to seek to welcome the other and the excluded into these fragile spaces, i.e. feeling quotas and exacting hastened inclusion policies for the violence will only be worsened. The task is to commit to practices of knowing and care that critically interrogate 
the fraught and their contemporary form, uprooting weak foundations, rerooting upon new healthy ones. Let us know and care for the other, ourselves and society at large in equal measure, without prejudice. Let us know and care about bodies and their politics. Um, so I just thought that this was incredible because I think what Yasomi is saying is that we need to actively recenter who and who our publics are. How can we, in knowing that the history of museums stems from a very Eurocentric um, white gaze and um, history, how can we reorient our museum spaces to think through publics that in include um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, publics that include queer and trans folks, um, publics that represent the future of our country? Um, and how can, beyond caring for art objects, how can we care for bodies in this space? What does that look like? And then this final uh, word here is restructuring. So we'll go to the image, final image. So this is an image by, um, by an artist, Sean Leonardo of Eric Garner, his chokehold in the chokehold that you see here. Um, I show this image because this image was supposed to be a part of a series of works that Leonardo was supposed to show at MoCA Cleveland. Uh, the show was titled The Breath of Empty Space, which includes images of Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, but also Tamir Rice, who, as we remember, is from Cleveland. Um, so uh, the museum, basically the museum is gonna put up this show. Um, local black uh, activists and um, people in the community actively pushed against the show going up and canceling the show because they did not want to see images and did not ask for the museum to bring these images um, to that space. Um, so, Sean Leonardo basically said that, you know, I must make it clear I was never given the opportunity to be included in outreach and never had a moment to engage any community member regarding the show. What has become to me is that after grave mishandling of, misc of communication regarding the exhibition, institutional white fragili fragility led to an act of censorship. Um, so the artist who identifies as Afro-Latinx um, felt that he did not have, have the opportunity to speak to a largely Black community. And the institution is in the center of all of this. The institution um, is led by um, who is a white woman. And um, after after this incident, Jill Snyder actually stepped down from her director position. And what she said is, MOCA has demonstrated a desire to work in the territory of inclusion and community. Now is the time to select a progressive and innovative leader for the next phase and who will carry forward this work with new passion. For that new leader to have a seat at the table, I willingly give up my chair. Um, so this idea of restructuring, you know, when we look at the ways in which staff um, and hierarchy and power for that matter are structured within these institutions, who's at the top, who's making the big decisions, and how does that affect or sort of manipulate out into the publics that these museum spaces serve? So what would it mean to sort of radically restructure these spaces to think about the future? Um, so again, these four words are just words that I'd like all of us to sit with. Um, I know I just gave out a lot of information, but um, maybe I can share some links afterwards. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, I just want to say those four words again. Re repatriate, recentering, and re restructure. Um, and I can, I can appreciate the turmoil and the productiveness of this moment for our art institutions and um, perhaps they're more nimble than some of our other institutions and they, I guess I can hope that um, what we learn about undoing the racism that lies at the foundation of 
these institutions will teach us as we work to undo racism in throughout all our institutions. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our third and final panelist. Ursula K. Heise is the chair of the UCLA Department of English and co-founder of the Lab for Environmental Narrative Strategies at UCLA's Institute on the Environment and Sustainability. Her research and teaching focus on contemporary literature and the environmental humanities, arts and cultures in the Americas, Germany, Japan, and Spain, science fiction, and narrative theory. Welcome, Ursula. It's a great pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. And so I wanted to round off our panel by thinking about um, the field of environmental justice, um, which overlaps with what we've heard so far, but it is a little bit different. So environmental justice is both a social movement and a body of research and scholarship that's developed over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and that at its most basic um, foundation, foundation access to environmental benefits such as clean air and clean water and who is exposed to environmental risks like pollution, deforestation, biodiversity, and of course climate change. Um, can we start the um, presentation please? So in the United States, um, the environmental justice movement took off in the 1980s and the year 1987 was particularly important because that's when the Reverend uh, ben, Benjamin Chavis coined the term environmental racism. And, and can we have the next slide here? Um, it's also the year when the Church of Christ Commission for Right Racial Justices report Toxic Waste and Race in the United States came out. Um, so what this report documented for the first time um, was that um, trees and toxic waste dumps are much more frequently located near poor communities and communities of color than near affluent white community. Um, next slide, please. The sociologist Robert Bullard followed that up um, of his book, Dumping in Dixie, Race, Class, and Environmental Justice, um, where he documented much more extensively some of the same phenomena that um, poor people and poor people uh, and people of color in the United States are much more exposed to environmental risks. Um, and as we were beginning to see um, shortly afterwards, have less access to things like parks and green spaces. Um, so, from the late 80s into the early 90s, the idea of environmental justice and the way in which um, socioeconomic inequality and racial inequality really also affect how we think about the environment and about conservation um, really took off in the United States. In 1991, um, there was the first People Environmental Justice Leadership Summit, which uh, formulated 17 principles of environmental justice. And in 1994, President Clinton um, issued an order to address environmental justice issues in minority and low income communities. Next slide, please. So um, environmental justice in the United States at that point and to some extent up to the present day has very much focused on environmental racism posed on members of a different race. Um, and the Environmental Protection Agency um, broadened that a little bit. Um, and you can see in the definition that I've put on the slide that they officially adopted um, in the 1990s that um, it, their definition of environmental justice has to do with unequal exposure to environmental risks and unequal access to environmental benefits. But they also mention meaningful involvement of all people. So that adds another dimension um, that um, corresponds a little bit to what Aaron um, alluded to earlier in the realm of museums, that is the question of who gets to make decisions about land use, about what regulations should be, about uh, how much money should be spent on what particular sites or problems of the environment. Um, so this was a very important step when environmental justice actually became part of the um, US government policy. 
Now, um, in other countries, of course, environmental justice also took off. And especially in the global south and developing countries, movements for environmental justice had actually been going on for quite a while. And they had focused on similar problems, exposure to pollution, access to green spaces, um, and so forth. But they weren't always focused on race. Um, it was about environmental justice, but not always about environmental racism and other issues like um, differences of class or caste, um, gender inequality, differences of, of ethnicity and, and religion um, play a huge role in other parts of the world in distributing who gets access to nature and who suffers from adverse effects of floods, hurricanes, wildfires, and so on. Um, next slide, please. So um, quite frequently, um, that was referred to as the environmentalism of the, the Indian Ramachandra Guha and the Catalan um, Joan Martinez Allier, who um, Ramachandra Guha worked mostly on movements in India. Joan Martinez Allier, who's originally from the Catalan region of Spain, worked um, mostly on Latin American um, environmental movements. Uh, they made the point that there are all these movements in the global South um, that um, should be recognized as illisms and that um, should be recognized as struggles for environmental justice. Next slide, please. So, um, oh, sorry, actually, let's go back. <laughs> Sorry, let's go back to the previous. So in the, in the global south, that often involved indigenous communities, peasants and villagers, the means of their material survival. It, there were often fights against the degradation of land, against deforestation, against water pollution or water privatization. And quite often, though not all, struggle against corporations, either from the country in question or from international corporations, and sometimes also um, against their own governments. Um, so the struggle to, to use or continue to use local resources has been really crucial to um, this, this fight for environmental justice in the global south. Now, please, let's go to the next slide. So since then, um, the uh, sort of definition of environmental justice worked on by a lot of people and has been fought for in a lot of different parts of the world typically recognize that environmental justice um, includes four different dimensions that I've put on the slide here for you. So the first one is distributive justice. So that's what I've already mentioned. So access to environmental resources and benefits. And then on the other hand, protection from risks and scarcities um, and danger. Um, but the uh, second dimension that already emerged in the EPA definition that I showed you um, also came to play a huge role, and that's the question of participatory justice. So who is involved in decision-making over environmental issues? Who decides whether there's gonna be a wildlife refuge or a national park somewhere, and what does that imply for the local communities that live in a particular place? Um, the power to veto in in environmental decision-making is particularly important, because if you don't have the right to say no, often that means that your power is just um, theoretical, and also the power to implement environmental decisions. I mean, in quite a few countries, including some areas in the United States, the problem is not so much that we don't have good environmental laws, terrific laws, but if there's no power to actually execute those and force them, then often they don't really make a difference for how people live. The third one, um, third dimension is called capabilities justice. And um, what we mean by that is really the possibility for flourishing and living a full life, um, primarily for humans, of course, in terms of uh, access to health, um, access to mobility, forming social bonds, living according to cultural norms, um, forming em emo emotional ties, and there are a bunch of others. But, but typically, people who have talked about capabilities just have all on humans. So, what about the animals and plants and what becomes of their flourishing when we live with them? And how can we make sure that the non-humans also flourish in our shared ecosystems? And the fourth dimension is recognition justice. Uh, that's been particularly important in countries such as Canada, United States and Australia, Latin America, um, where there is large indigenous communities 
that have what we now call TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, which often anticipates some of the findings of modern science, but sometimes deviates from it. But the acknowledgement that there are different kinds of knowledge um, about nature and different kinds of managing ecosystems has become really important. And to not just say, oh, uh, ecological and biological scientists know it all and they just go out and others, but also the, the importance of learning from local communities and indigenous communities and, um, you know, knowing something about how they have managed ecosystems in the past. Um, and also that includes, of course, respect for the spiritual and religious meanings of nature for particular communities. So that's clearly very important. And it's something that um, science typically doesn't take into account, but that when you want to talk about the restoration or conservation of systems is often really, really important. Um, what is at stake when a particular area, a particular mountain or a particular valley is considered sacred? So to what extent um, can we change it and who is allowed to change it and have access to it? So that's sort of in a, in a nutshell, sort of where environmental justice thinking and environmental justice activism is at right now, really pursuing these four dimensions. Next slide, please. So in my own work, um, I've become interested in cases where um, it's not so clear um, how we should make a, how, how we should um, adjudicate how we should decide on particular issues of environmental justice. And sometimes those involve decisions between different human communities. So what if on one hand, we want to preserve mangrove swamps, say, in Louisiana, but what if there's also a poor community that really would love to have better access to nearby shopping? Um, how, do we, how do we decide these kinds of issues when you really have different kinds of interests um, and human and non-human interests really pitted against each other. Um, and then the other thing that I've been really interested in is um, how, do we, how do we sort of decide between the claims that human communities have on their being considered and on their being given justice, and what do we do when at the same time there's also claims on our sense of justice on the part of non-humans. That is, what do we think about the rights of animals and plants to continue to exist in a certain place? And how do we balance that? How do we balance it, particularly when the fate of poor communities is at stake? And in all of this, of course, one big question is always, is that we, who's included in that we? So to think about some of these really complicated issues, um, I came up with a term multi-species justice. So meaning, justice between different non-human species, but also between us humans as, um, as a vastly unequal species and other kinds of species. So conflicts between human communities, but then also between human and non-human communities. Um, so what emerges when you look at these problems is that um, they're sort of two big stories. And I'm really, as a scholar of literature, I've always been really, really interested in narrative and storytelling. So in this book that I published a few years ago, Imagining Extinction, I was particularly interested in what stories get told about um, multi-species justice. And it turns out that there's two stories. One is the story that, oh, what's good for the land is good for the people. What's good for non-humans is also good for humans, in which you can um, achieve environmental justice just by doing what makes sense ecologically. That's particularly true when you deal with scenarios of pollution. It's good for humans, all kinds of humans, and it's good for non-humans if you clean up the air, you clean up the water, you clean up the soil. But then there's a second narrative and a second kind of scenario that's more complicated. Um, sometimes, conservation organizations from the global north, from Europe and North America, have gone into Asia and Africa and Latin America and have imposed certain measures that they thought were good to preserve the local environment, like creating national parks. But then that meant for local communities, sometimes that they could no longer hunt or log trees or do certain kinds of harvesting in these national parks. And so 
um, there's a long history of conflict between local communities and um, mostly white, mostly global north run conservation only began to be really acknowledged in the 1990s. And these days, you know, a lot of environmental organizations really have uh, totally changed their MO because of that and don't, will not undertake any conservation actions without co consulting all the stakeholders in the region. But still, um, these two narratives, what's good for the land is good for the people, what's good for the non-humans is good for the people. Um, and the other one, one that's more where northerners once again come in and impose their will and their vision of nature at the expense of local communities um, has also been really important. Um, and so I've been really interested in seeing how these two sort of cont contrary narratives have played themselves out in different parts of the world. And I just wanted to give you one example of how that's tr been translated into literature. And I hear follow a little bit in Aaron step to art, but by showing you a novel um, that came out in 2005. Can we have the next slide, please? It was written by the um, Indian novelist Amitav Ghosh, who's from the Bengal um, region of India, and it's called The Hungry Tide. It's set in the, uh, which is a coastal mangrove wetlands on the Bay of Bengal, and in my PowerPoint present, you can sort of see a satellite image of the Sundarbans um, as the background. This novel came out in 2005 and it's a wonderful and really complex novel. One of the historical incidents that actually happened that it works into its fictional universe is a confrontation in 1979 where the Indian government and the left cracked down on refugees um, from um, Bangladesh um, that had settled on an island in the Sundarbans um, in the mid-1970s. But the Sundarbans had been declared a tiger reserve in 1973, and the Indian government was very anxious that uh, if they let the refugees settle there, there would be ever more people would come, and the nature protection function of the, that whole era, they really cracked down very hard with the police siege and um, uh, as a consequence of the, of the siege, which cut off that community from its supplies and then a final crackdown, um, more than 4,000 people died. So that ties really um, a lot into what Isaac was talking about earlier on, where really police violence was deployed on, at the hands of a left-wing government and in the name of environmental conservation, um, but really um, you know, exactly a horrible toll on that community. So that's one of the histories that Amitav Ghosh um, deals with in this story. And as, um, if we can go to the next slide, one of the um, refugees at one point in recounting her story um, says this about her situation. The worst part was not the hunger or the thirst. And remember these, they were siege for months so they could not get supplies and were really going hungry. The worst part was not the hunger or the thirst, it was to sit here helpless and listen to the policemen making their announcements, hearing them say that our lives, our existence were worth less than dirt or dust. This island has to be saved for its trees. It has to be saved for its animals. It's part of a reserve forest. It belongs to a project to save tigers, which is paid for by people from all around the world. Every day sitting here with hunger, we would listen to these words over and over again. Who are these people, I wonder? who love kill us for them. Do they know what's being done in their name? Where do they live, these people? Do they have children? Do they have mothers, fathers? As I thought of these things, it seemed to me that this whole world had become a place of animals and our fault, our crime, was that we were just human beings. Um, so this is a really great way of, I think, narratively staging this conflict between the interests of the non-human world and conservation and the interests of a, of a very disenfranchised, powerless um, and poor community. And there's really interesting conversations that follow in the novel about the situation and different characters sort of take different positions where some of them say, um, well, but I mean, if you give up conservation, then the next people who will be, um, who will also be excluded from human rights will be precisely the poor 
that you're trying to protect. Whereas other people say, no, we wealthy Indians really have to take leave for this. It was also our fault that we didn't speak up. So there's a super interesting conversation um, after listening to this testimony um, that the different characters have. Next slide, please. So that's sort of um, the kind of conflict that I'm really interested in um, when I talk about multi-species justice and do research on it. Um, so what stories do we tell and from whose perspective? Who are the narrators? Who are the characters through whose eyes we see human and in some cases non-human? Um, and of course, these are, uh, these are conflicts that we have right here in Los Angeles. Angeles as well. As you may know, green areas are really unequally distributed over, um, over the Los Angeles area. There are a lot of kids in Los Angeles who've never been to the beach and don't know how to swim. So um, access to the benefits of the wonderful natural ecosystems that we have here in LA County is very unevenly distributed. Um, same thing goes those exposure to pollution, um, the areas where the smog is worst, where um, soil contamination and water contamination are worst, are often precisely in the neighborhoods that are poor communities and or communities of color. Um, so these questions of who has access and who doesn't um, come up all the time. And the question of, you know, um, do you put in another park so that poor communities have or do you try to build housing so that you know we have more affordable housing are often really acute and there's not simple or um, you know black and white answers to these questions. So I'm really interested in these issues. And then other issues too, and how we manage the nature in Los Angeles. Um, I always get annoyed when I see cats in my garden because they always come after um, songbirds and lakes, which I love. Um, but it's a complicated question. LA has anywhere between 800,000 and 2 million feral cats. So not just cats that people let out. Those are most of the cats in my neighborhood, but cats that actually don't have a home that were um, abandoned or were even born from other abandoned cats. And they wreak havoc on a lot of our natural ecosystems, but don't these cats also have a, a right to live? So um, the question of how we decide about the life and death of non-humans that co-inhabit the city with us is also part of multi-species justice. Um, so that's sort of just a, a quick nutshell overview of how the environmental movement since the 1980s really has been deeply involved with some of the questions of decision-making, of policing, of socioeconomic inequality and racial inequality that Isaac and Aaron have also talked about. Thanks so much. Mm, thank you, Aaron. Uh, as if we, if we might have thought that justice was um, a clear possibility and it's a question of where we put our resources. You have certainly made this a messy, challenging uh, set of choices that are constantly being made around us. Um, there are no clear answers and um, very little moral clarity. So uh, thank you for complicating this and for letting us see just where we are with um, these very difficult choices. I want to invite um, Isaac, I see Aaron. I want to invite everyone back together for a moment. Um, I'm sure Isaac will be here in a second. Um, before we invite you students and the public to go off into your own discussion groups to talk about the events of this evening. Welcome back over here, Isaac. Um, I think it would be great to just take a moment. I know that you've all alluded so beautifully to one another's presentations, but just to take a moment to share observations or thoughts or points of connection that you've seen this evening and um, in many ways, very different talks all, on, all attempting to address the subject of justice, which is far too big for an evening. Um, so look, just a, a candid, opportunity to share some thoughts. The first couple of thoughts, I think that when I saw Aaron pull up the artwork of, of Eric Gardner's death, you know, it, it, there was an immediate synergy for me, but um, being familiar with some of Ursula's work and having previous conversations, thinking about this from a, 
a multi-species perspective and kind of a, a shared fate when it comes to justice, um, I think definitely brought new ways of thinking home for me. And I was grateful to hear that. Yeah, I think, um, again, to go back to Ursula, I think um, you bring in such an important part of this equation around justice and thinking about how, you know, land and the environment is not neutral space at all. Um, and we, when we think about the origins of this country, it was the land that was in folks um, to create the American economy that exists today. And that originally, um, of course, belonged to indigenous people. Right. So I think um, that is a, it's a topic that I think for whatever reason doesn't always sort of make those cultural and racial connections. So I really appreciate the work that you do. And, you know, I think Isaac, I could just second everything <laughs> that you said, um, you know, and uh, what I really appreciated about your presentation was the stats, you know, I think also thinking about these quote unquote civic facilities, these government-led facilities, facilities that are supposed to care for and support our communities when so often they are really just spaces that continue to dehumanize and incarcerate them. And so um, I appreciate you bringing some, you know, uh, legibility to that. So in terms of, of environmentalism, environmentalism started out as a very white movement in the 1960s, and it only really became um, more diverse after the rise of the environmental justice movement in the in the 80s and 90s. And I think um, what you is exactly right that I think for a lot of sort of white middle class environmentalists, nature was sort of like a refuge from some of the from from in the first from cities, from violence, um, in some cases also from politics, although it's got to be said that environmentalism has always been um, a very political issue in a variety of ways. Um, but um, just how we understand nature and how we approach it is part and parcel of the inequalities that also structure the rest of our society. Really, um, you know, it was something that only, only came home with the environmental justice movement in the in the 1980s. And so it really, really uh, was a revolution, I think, in environmental thinking. I think in, in some other parts of the world, it's not been quite as drastic from, from the beginning. I mean, my home country of Germany, um, I think social, social and environmental issues were always a little more entangled with each other. Not necessarily issues, but certainly issues of inequality and so forth. Um, uh, and um, and in, in, you know, um, in, in India and Latin America too, I mean, um, you know, movements to protect certain natural areas often included cultural monuments and a certain cultural heritage. So we're much more in, embroiled in, in social questions and issues. Um, but I think everywhere um, with climate change now, these questions are just intimately um, tied into each other, where on one hand, climate change threatens all of us in one way or another. Um, but it's also clear that it does not put everybody equally at risk. You know, some people have talked about climate redlining in coastal cities. That is the fact that it's precisely um, the neighborhoods that were traditionally redlined racially are now also the ones that are most at risk risk from floorboards. So um, I think I think now um, uh, it's very clear that nature at every last part and parcel of our political discussions and our, our social struggles. Well, maybe we'll take a, a little pause there. We'll return to the three of your conversation. Um, Let's make use of our Zoom technologies to bring all of us closer together. For the next 12 to 15 minutes, we invite you to consider what you've heard about justice this evening. Is there a standout moment, a new insight, something you wanna know more about, an interesting friction that will lead to a question that you'd like to ask a panelist or two? 
Students, you received an email today with the Zoom address you will go to next, a chat. Please head there immediately. For those non-enrolled guests, friends, faculty, and colleagues who wish to engage one another in a small group, please look in the chat function to go to a separate Zoom meeting where you will join breakout rooms for discussion. Note that you will leave this webinar to participate in these discussions and then you'll return to the webinar afterwards. Instructions will be available every step of the way. So off with you. And stay put right where you are, virtually speaking, as well. This year, we're partnering with UCLA's Visual and Performing Arts Education Program, also known as VAPA, to extend these conversations deeper into the community by engaging middle and high school students from five public schools from across the city in the 10 Questions Project. Each cohort of students has generated their own classroom conversations and created artwork in response to select questions. Tonight, we welcome UCLA Community School AP art students and their teacher, Mr. Anthony Matti, into our virtual classroom and are honored to share the work that these students have created in response to the question, what is justice? We hope you enjoy their extraordinary contribution to the conversation. So now, with no further delay, regardless of whether you journey to a breakout room or pause to view works from the talented students of the UCLA school, enjoy your travels and see you back here in, in this space in about 12 to 15 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you made it back. Uh, some extraordinary questions. So I think we'll uh, go straight to some questions for our guests. Um, and maybe for our first question, please answer to or, you know, don't worry about my inviting you to answer. What does hope have to do with it? How are hope and justice connected? I will break the ice and go first. Um, I think they are inextricably connected. You can't pursue justice um, without having some hope because I think, at least for me, when injustice is so visual and so visceral, it, it's cynical and it's easy to just accept this is the way things are, this is the way things have been, this is the way things always be. Um, but I think having that hope, pounding yourself in that hope is what allows us to fight harder uh, for the world we want to see and for the justice we all deserve. And so if you don't have hope, I don't know that you can really have the justice you deserve. I totally agree with that. And one thing that helps me is I'm a big science fiction fan. Um, so I love to read book future and different people's imagination of the future. Um, but um, about science fiction, you know, in the last 20 years or so is that so much of it is very bleak and dystopian. Um, and so I always look to the writers who do hold out hopeful visions. One of them is Kim Stanley Robinson, who's uh, a California writer. And he likes to use this term optopia. So, okay, we're never gonna get utopia. You know, our society is never gonna be perfect, um, but it can be, you know, Optopia is kind of the best you can get given the circumstances. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it can be a lot better than what we have now. Um, and that's sort of something that that really sort of cheers me up when I get too bogged down in bleak dystopias and post-apocalyptic wastelands where people eat each other. Um, you know, it's like, no, actually society can also get better. And whether it does or not depends on what we do now and whether we get engaged. And, um, and so, so I love to go to those stories and, and that's sort of what helps me do exactly what Isaac was talking about, you know, sort of 
um, thinking up a vision of what a just our society would look like and then work for it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to another question unless you wanted to jump in there, Erin. What do you think? Okay. Um, these are all questions from you all and um, I'm just the um, trans transmitter of these great questions. Here's a question for you, Erin. Are there any museums today that are completely decolonized? Is that even possible? That's a wonderful question um, and brings up a conversation that um, we've been having internally at the Hammer, or I think just in our curatorial team, like how does this word decolonize actually work in, in sort of in response to museums? You know, is it possible to actually decolonize a museum or would the act of decolonizing a museum actually mean abolishing it considering the histories, the sort of colonial legacies that museums stem from. And so I think I, I you know, I don't know, um, but I will say that I think there are several art projects and other art organizations that are attempting to do that work and to think through that. Um, I will say that I think past few years that there have been some incredible indigenous and native curators that have joined contemporary museums who are really sort of at the center of this question. Um, and are we thinking ways to use the cultural objects that have been housed at museum in liberatory and radical ways? So I hope that there is an answer to that question soon. Um, and I think there are several folks who are doing that work. Thank you, Erin. And here's a related kind of expansion on that for everyone here. Is it possible to create an institution that does not discriminate against someone in some way? I think we have to clarify the definition of what we mean by discriminate. Um, I think if, if, do I believe that there are civic institutions that can be set up that do not serve to be more advantageous to some than others? I don't. Uh, but I think in the construction of those institutions, it's important for us to outline who the beneficiary of them uh, is supposed to be. And in my mind, the role of a civic society is to improve the conditions of life for the least of us, right? And so our structures should be geared towards alleviating poverty, uplift the bottom, uh, improving the, the marginal conditions of life for the folks who who are struggling the hardest. And that might, or the expense of those who are at the top. Uh, and I think that that is something to be mindful of and that balance and to what degree that swing is and how closer it is to parity depends on how close our society is to parity. We have examples across the world, international examples where there isn't such an extreme uh, income, wealth, inequality, there aren't 30,000 people living on the streets in the same city where there's a disproportionate number of billions doesn't exist in some other countries. And so their civic institutions, I think are more kind of objective and neutral towards the well-being of everybody in an equal way. Um, but I think the way our society is set up, there is gonna be a trade-off. And historically that trade-off has not been for the least of us. It has not been for the most marginalized. Uh, it has disproportionately exacerbated that kind of structural inequality. And so. I'm going to think about that one a little bit more. I think that's a great question, whoever asked it. And then I think you should think about it more as well. Um, all right. I have another question to you all. Um, and this question is for Ursula, but open to everyone. How much is environmental justice discussed when discussing issues of migration and refugee issues? And I I think you said to that through Gosh's book, but perhaps um, you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, so these days a lot, um, I mean, these, these issues have really become intertwined, but, um, uh, but it's a complicated, they're complicated issues um, because um, sometimes when you talk about 
I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, what I mean by that is that there's a lot of discussion, of course, about climate migration um, and the way in which, for example, um, the influx of Central American immigrants into the United States um, these days is actually in in palms. I mean, there's, you know, regions in Guatemala and El Salvador where the droughts have just become so intense that people can't really live off of the land anymore in the way that they used to. So, um, so that becomes, um, a, you know, a driver of migration. The same is true for migration from Africa into Europe. I mean, there's just not that living conditions were ideal, you know, in either Central America or in many African countries. Um, even before climate change or, you know, um, other environmental problems became huge issues. Um, but as with so much else, you know, these environmental problems make um, inequalities worse and then often become the tipping point um, that drive people into migration. So I think there is a lot of discussion of this. And, um, and one of the re reasons that a lot of national security establishments consider climate change a major threat to secure that it's going to um, exacerbate military conflicts and that trigger huge waves of, of migration. So in the environmental community, that is being discussed a fair amount. A really good question. Do we want to stay with that a little bit longer? Think about relationship with refugee communities. Well, let me throw another one your way. We can come back to it. Um, just a really beautiful, simple, clear question. Can you address the concepts of equity versus equality? The difference between equity and equality. So, I mean, what, what has helped me understand um, that that difference and what I sometimes use in my in my classes is a little cartoon of um, three people who are like different heights standing in front of a fence and the biggest person is so tall that they can look over the fence all by themselves. Um, then, you know, the second person is a little bit shorter and they need a, a small stool and the third person is quite a bit shorter and they need a big stool. Um, so that's equity, I think. Um, so we're not looking for equality. We're not, not everybody's going to ever be the same height. Not everybody's going to be born with the same amount of wealth. Not everybody's going to be born with a talent to, you know, um, make lots of money playing sports or playing music or something like that. So what we're trying to do is to level the playing field so that people can take advantage of the same opportunities, right? Um, so equality, I think, to me is that everybody, the outcome has to be the same. Equity means that we have the same point of departure for everybody. That will be sort of, I think, a simple way of distinguishing them. And so I think a, a lot of justice today um, is about equity avoiding a more level playing field you'll never create a totally level one probably but um but a more level playing field um and i think the i but i think it's moved away from thinking that be the same is that fair is that how you guys understand it i'm curious i think I, there's you know there's lots of different analogies folks use to me I think about, I don't know, I'm kind of making this example on the fly based on other examples I've heard, but if, if I get a dollar a day every day here and you get no dollar a day every day for a year, and then on year two, I decide everyone gets a dollar a day, that's equality. Everyone now gets a dollar a day, but we have not addressed the fact that I didn't get a dollar all of last year. And there's a need for that kind of redress and thinking about the inequality that's been created by the fact that advantages have been disproportionately um, concentrated however long. And so for example, the condition of black folks in this country, you're talking about 400 years or, or disproportionate wealth and resources and mobility gained at the ex lethal expense of black lives. When you're talking about slavery and indigenous lives and in so many other ways that, that there has been this, this gap growing. And so equitable policies and thinking about equity means redress. It means thinking about 
about the things and considerations and not just, well, now everybody gets the same thing. It's about understanding the fact that so many folks have been without due to our policies, due to discriminations, to the banning of these kinds of things that we have to, we have to be mindful of that. In fact, not to bring it back to the ballot, but Proposition 16 is an equity measure here in the state of California because we know what Prop 209 did in terms of banning affirmative action and thinking about not just college, college admissions, but also contracting with local governments and any other use as an important thing to think about uh, when moving civically in California. And, and uh, I think we can do better and should do better, but that's kind of where I think about equality versus equity. Thank you. Um, I want to, there are a bunch of questions thinking about our role. What, you know, what is it that we do to move ourselves and our communities to sin? And this feels like a super important question um, in terms of the arts. How important are the roles of artists in moments of political, social, and economic unrest? Yeah, I think about that question a lot. And I think it's something that obviously, you know, just that monument was reimagined. Um, is something that's happening right now. I mean, I feel like artists are the soundtrack to political revolution. Um, create the aesthetics and the visuals um, for the public. And, um, you know, I think this is throughout history, but, um, you know, I think so much about like the Black arts movement and how it really coincided with the emergence of and um, I think about just the Black radical tradition in this country. Um, you know, I don't know. It's just there's so many and movements to consider. But I guess what I'll say is I think art is extremely important. Um, it's sort of a, a different in opportunity to interpret um, the situation. And oftentimes I find art is a great meeting place for folks who are perhaps on different sides of the conversation to come together through the vessel of an art object to then have a conversation. And so I feel like art can also be this like intermediary or this space to um, open up a dialogue. I feel super mixed about this kind of question because I run into it all the time too with, with writing, you know, what, what differences writing make, what, what difference does literature make? And on one hand, I think I totally agree with Aaron that I think it's super important for, for opening up the imagination and for really, um, you know, making it fun and, and pleasurable and aesthetically pleasing to think about justice. On the other hand, I sometimes think, oh man, when I'm too much with my colleagues and with my writer friend, I think, oh man, you know, we're just thinking too much about about literature and art and we're not thinking enough about the hard and boring work of sitting on committees you know working out alternative policies going door to door um you know doing community organizing and you know getting the vote out those kinds of things you know there's also a lot of a lot of stuff that can be really boring and really nerdy and really in the weeds and that's not so much fun, but that's actually really, really important. So I think sort of finding these bridges between our visions and what, and then that hard everyday work of making the revolution or the reform or optopia or whatever it is, whatever you wanna call it, actually making it happen. That's, that's the hard part, I think. You know, is, is sort of, I mean, I sometimes think that when I think, oh my God, I'm sitting on my, in my fourth committee meeting, you know, <laughs> this, but today, but, but that work too is necessary and it's not half as fun, but it is real. That's how you change power configurations, you know, and that's how you, how you change how things are run. And so I, I always feel torn between these two because my love is on the side of literature and art. And then I also feel I have to do the other work, which is super important. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to respond to that saying art is not always fun. And in fact, it's liberal, true. <laughs> boring, it's political. Yeah, um, that's true. It, and I think- True of writing too. <laughs> uh, 
say that artists and artist fun and, and call it a day. Art is extremely tough, extremely scholarly, extremely great. And I'll just use an example from 2018 at the Hammer Museum. There's an artist named E.J. Hill who actually went to the MFA program at UC. And for Made in LA, the biennial that we have every two Years. He is mainly known as a performance artist and doing long durational performances. And his piece, uh, he was someone who was born and raised in, in Los Angeles. His piece um, was dedicated to the many schools that he went to um, and just sort of thinking about academia as a space that this society are always supposed to participate in. We don't necessarily do the hard work of considering how those spaces harm us, specifically people of color and queer folks, um, and what the socializing in that space does. And so um, for his piece, he stood on a pedestal for the entire three months of the show for all open hours of the museum. So he didn't wow. take any restroom breaks. He didn't My God. Breaks. He was standing there. And he stood there for one who felt like he did, who felt like they were, who felt like the work that he was doing was not considered deep or laborious. And I just feel like that piece changed my life and really helped me understand that art can be a social practice. It can inspire people to do the hard work. Um, it is the hard work. It looks and feels all sorts of different ways. And I just want to honor that. No, you're right. And, and, and that, is, that is perfectly true. And it's true, of course, of writing as well, which often is, is incredibly laborious. I mean, in order to address, you know, what that performance wanted to highlight, you know, that's when you need to sit on the committees and design different admissions policies and different grading policies and those kinds of things, right? Um, so, so I wanted to sort of put those two, two realms in correspondence. So I totally agree, of course, that literature and art, you know, are incredibly important in just kindling our imaginations and imagining a different world and a different society. Um, thank you, Ash. It was really great to, to hear these two um, very different perspectives um, on the kinds of work that is going on and will continue to go on as we move justice. Um, We're actually out of time, but I want to leave you each. I know it's so sad, but I want to leave you each just like seconds to um, help us think through um, what actions we can take um, to, uh, whether it's to uh, um, for the environment. Okay, this is ridiculous, but try. What what is the first thing that comes to your mind when we when we think about how can we move this project forward? Um, Go vote. That's my question to you. Go vote. Get informed about all the not just not just for your representatives from the lowest to the highest level, but also get informed about those propositions and initiatives that are on the ballot. That is the most important thing you can do right now is getting your vote out there. You know, one election isn't gonna bring us liberation. We have to vote, but there's a need to understand these issues at a deeper structural level and, and understand how much work has gone into maintaining this infrastructure for our society, because it's gonna take at least that much work to deconstruct it and build the future we deserve. So organize, more family, talk to your friends, uh, continue to educate ourselves, uh, but also practice self-care. That's the last thing I would say, uh, because the movement is gonna keep moving without you, uh, but the movement definitely does need you. So balance things for yourself as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say tap into the imagination to um, creativity. Um, again, I just want to reference Freedom Dreams by Robin D.G. Kelly. Um, Freedom Dreams, Black Radical Imagination. It's this incredible book where 
you know, each chapter sort of outlines a black liberation movement. And he kind of goes back to this notion that if it weren't for the radical capacity to imagine uh, a future that isn't oppressive, you know, that these movements would have ceased to exist. And so I just feel like that that's a center point um, to start from. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you all. I want to thank you, our guests and our audience for being here with us tonight. Whether your loved ones are near or far away, let's depart this gathering with an intention towards creating a meaningful presence and a more just world. Not only for those who are already in our circle of care, but also for those who may be less known to us and less privileged in our communities. In parting this evening, I want to again acknowledge not only the presence of our fellow humans, but also of the non-human life that grows and changes around us and to which we are so profoundly interconnected and dependent on. As well, I wanna thank all of the many people who are behind the scenes on this, making this happen. Um, so this concludes this evening's program, 10 questions. We hope you will join us again next week for What is Power? Same time, new link. And to learn more about the entire series or to RSVP, please visit arts.ucla.edu backslash questions. For anyone wishing to continue the conversation for a few more minutes, you're invited to stick around for an informal post-show chat with our guests. Should you choose to say, stay, we ask that you turn on your cameras and use the Zoom raise hand feature in the participants window to indicate that you'd like to join us. Thank you. And until next week, good night. <laughs>